I retweeted this post recently. What opinion will you defend like this? To which I said, backend code that generates plain HTML responses is still the best way to build 90% of applications. It got a good amount of attention, and I'm making this video because I wanted to defend that statement and expand on it a little more. Let's say that we have a web app. Something super simple, like a table that displays a bunch of data and a way to filter it out with inputs at the top. Using a front-end framework like React, or in this case, Vue, this is accomplished by hooking into events on these inputs, getting back data, usually in the form of JSON, and then parsing that out into a template that's populated in the DOM as our table. But why? Why go through that middle layer of returning JSON if what we want to end up with is structured HTML? Doesn't it make more sense to just return the HTML? And that's what this video will be talking about. See, most backend frameworks come with an out-of-the-box ability to return back structured HTML using templates or some kind of bespoke markup language. Take this dashboard, for instance, that I built with Laravel. It's not a single-page application. Instead, each view is returned back as HTML. It's not incredibly slick, but as an application following a basic CRUD pattern, it accomplishes its goals pretty well. Each page immediately has the data present on it that it needs as soon as it comes over the wire. This is the kind of methodology I feel has been strayed from and overcomplicated. Why add in an additional layer of complexity by abstracting out our front end using a separate framework when what we want can be accomplished using native HTML controls and maybe a sprinkling of modern JavaScript? This application doesn't need an API that's reached by external services, nor is it going to be ingested by a mobile app or desktop application. It'll exist solely in the browser. Let's go back to our original example. This initial view is being returned by my backend code. It's only the dropdowns and subsequent filtering that's being made dynamic by a front-end framework. So instead, let's remove the front-end framework. These dropdowns at the top are valid HTML form inputs. Instead of hooking into their change events, we can have them perform a default submit action on the form. And that looks like this. So we have a blank action on our form, and whenever one of these selects is changed, the form is submitted using this form submit. For our backend code powering this, you can see that on the initial request, we're getting all of our models, as well as the possible makes and colors of them to populate those dropdowns. And then we're just returning the HTML view. On the front end, that looks like this. But when I go and select one of these colors to filter from, the URL updates the form submit successfully. But the problem is, is that we're not filtering these out. Now we just need to apply any potential filters to our backend code's response. So now we have a filter for our make as well as our color. So now if I go ahead and select a color like blue, we can see that we're getting the same result, a filtered set. And we can filter out a make as well. The best part about this is we also have a state or record of our filters stored as the URL currently being loaded. This can be copied and shared or opened in another browser. And the same set is returned as expected. This is what I meant in my tweet. This is the simplicity of stepping back and having your application's foundation be a backend that returns HTML. Of course, this isn't without a downside. For each request, we're seeing a hard reload of the entire application, and that might not be a desirable trait. Additionally, this method does require you to deploy and maintain a backend application, a backend layer. But there's things that we can do to make this a smoother experience without sacrificing that simplicity. Let's go ahead and using the same example, head back into our code base. And in the HTML template for this, let's eliminate the page reload through just a few lines of modern JavaScript. So instead of on change being this form submit, it's going to call a function which we will create. We'll call it filter vehicles. Now let's go ahead and create that function. Okay, so filter vehicles is a function. The first thing that we're going to do is grab the current URL that we're going to use as the main entry point. So that is our const URL. It's a new URL object for our current location in the window. We need to add our filters onto that just like we would if we were submitting the form as a get request in the browser. So we have a query parameter for the color as well as the make. Next, we need to actually get this updated data set from our endpoint. So we can create a fetch request to the same URL that we're using when we submitted the form organically. And then we're going to use that response as text back and replace what's in the table with whatever we get back from that request. And then we'll push that updated URL into the window history so that we have that state available. 
Now, as it stands right now, if we were to go ahead and run this, we'd run into a little bit of a problem. You see, if we go ahead and select something like the make, our entire site is what is being replaced inside of this table. But we don't want that. We just want the table data to be replaced by the table. There's a couple different ways we can do this. Because I want to use the same URL instead of having to create a second separate URL just for table data, we can include a header that we can look for in our backend code. So using fetch, we can just include this headers object. And I'm just going to call this something like x refresh and set it to true. So now if we go into our backend code, we can look for that header. So if our request has the header x refresh, what I want is to just return back our table data. And I can do that because I've already extracted out that table as a blade component here in our components folder. So using Laravel, I can just say, all right, return view components table, and then include some data that it's expecting. So now let's go ahead and save this and see how that looks. All right, I'll start over from a blank slate. Let's go ahead and choose a color. And we can choose a make. And we can see that all of this is updating without making a full refresh of the browser. We can actually test that. So if we go to our network tab here and we'll make another update. Well, that returned no said, but let's just say we want all Honda makes. We can see that we're calling our URL and we're getting a response back just of the table HTML. So exactly what we're expecting. This is great for small changes and islands of interactivity throughout a page, but can get kind of messy the more complicated we get and the more complex a page gets. There's a few tools that can help abstract this out and make the process of replacing HTML from the server more easy. I wouldn't necessarily call these frameworks as they're lightweight and more aimed toward wrapping modern JavaScript functionality than building full-scale interactive applications with whole DOM manipulation. Let's look at an example using a popular library that's built for this, HTMX. And we'll use the same example that we've been working on for now. And you can see we've made basically no adjustments to our backend code. So let's go ahead and see what's different in the front end. So if we scroll down into our form section here, we can see here that both of the selects that we have don't have a change event associated with them anymore. And that's because that's all being handled at the top level through the form element. HTMX uses custom attributes in order to create this functionality for us. HX get means that we are going to be performing a get request and then it asks for a URL. So we'll be using like before, just the current URL that we're on. The target here under HX target is the HTML element that is going to be replaced with whatever comes back from that request. HX trigger tells when that is going to happen in this case, it's on any change events underneath the form. Because we only have two elements, both of those selects, this is only going to trigger when those selects have changed their value. And then finally, HX push URL updates the URL in the browser so that we have that same state. And let's go ahead and see how this works. So we'll go back into our browser and let's go ahead and make a selection. And we are seeing the exact same functionality that we saw before. Anytime that we make a selection, we have our table update with just the information that comes back from our server. And then again, like before, we have this state here at the top, so we can copy this URL, open up into a new browser, and we have the exact same data set return on the initial load. Another cool example about using HTMX is that with just a single attribute, we can have an SPA-like functionality. So in my backend, I have this route, page, and then a page number that should loop between pages one through five. I also have a set of links with either previous or next. Let's visit one of these pages in the browser and see what it looks like. All right, so we're on page one and we can use the links below to navigate. So let's go to the next page. Two, three, four, five. Back to four, back to three. Now you might not be able to notice, but there's no hard refreshing happening between this navigation. I can open up my network and prove that by going back and forth between these pages. What does the markup look like that's powering this? All I'm doing is just dynamically creating this page based on whatever the number that was passed in using this page variable. But the magic comes with this HX boost attribute set at the top element. What this does is it tells HTMX that we want to treat this and act like an SPA. Whenever one of these links is clicked, 
HTMX goes and makes that request in the background, grabs the HTML that comes back from the server, and then dynamically replaces the changed elements on the page with the new data. So you have a seamless transition between pages, but it's all HTML coming from the server. So if I refresh this page, I'm on the same state and I can manually adjust and go to page four. And the data that's populated on here immediately is the same HTML as if I was to go back and hit next again. And the links are populated, they're not dynamically created. So each page as it renders knows if there can be a previous page to view or a next page to view. This paradigm is known as hypermedia as the engine of application state, or HATOAS. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. There's a whole lot to touch on with this subject, and I'm not going to go too deeply into it in this video, but if you'd like to learn more, Google this and do some light reading. All right, these all might have seemed like trivial examples, so let's take a look at one more that's a little bit complicated, but something that I see on a fairly regular basis, a multi-step form. All right, this takes in a few different parts. The first is our form endpoint, and this will load up the initial view of our web form. All right, it's pretty straightforward. It just should show a button and then has our HTMX script added in here as well. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like in the browser. All right, get started. If we click on this, we can see that we are brought to a form that we can fill out. Now, how does this work in the background? Let's go ahead and back and peek at our code. So what's happening is when that button is clicked, it's sending a request to form and then one. And then the target is the example form uh, element, which is the element that the button is in. Now, where is this form one endpoint coming from? If we take a look at our backend code. We can see that we have another route here, form, and then a dynamic step. It's returning back a component based on whatever that step number is. And I've already added these in here in my components forms folder. So we have three steps for our form, each of which is going to be dynamically pulled in. So step one looks like this. Again, we have a form element that's using HTMX, but instead of making a get request, it's making a post request. And because there's no HX trigger, then it's happening at the default form submit action. Now you can see here, we have this errors object up here. If count errors, then we display some errors. So I wonder what happens if we try to submit this form without filling any of this information in. Well, we dynamically got back an error. We're just creating the HTML for these errors because this conditional here, if count errors, was true on the same HTML that's rendered whenever the form was initially loaded up. And this works because of one more endpoint that we have in our backend code. And it's the post that's happening on these same form endpoints. So we make a post to the exact same URL, but instead this time we're validating the data that comes through. So all of the attributes that could be possible on this form are validated. And if any of them fail, then we're just returning back the exact same component, but with the errors that happened. So let's go ahead and try to fill this out now. All right, let's try to go to the next step and we get the next step in the form which is just the HTML returned from the step two blade. And this is also using the exact same HTMX attributes, but posting to a different route. So let's go ahead and fill this one out as well. And clicking next, our validation passed, and we're on the final step, step three. And once we finish the form, we get a thank you message, and our data has been saved in the database successfully. Now I will say this is kind of messy, this code is definitely not the best, and there's plenty of ways to perform some abstraction and componentize this a little bit better so it's not repeated as much. But the fact remains is that we are using plain HTML to create this dynamic multi-step form. The best part about it is that each of these steps, each of these components, contains the knowledge inside of the HTML for what actions can be performed on that specific component. So we know whenever step one is loaded up, the form automatically knows when it's submitted, it's going to post to the form one endpoint. It's going to replace the inside of the example form element with the data that comes back, which just happens to be step two. This HTML is already formatted out. It knows all of the functionality that can happen inside of it because it already contains those elements. They're not built up from a front end framework. They're not created dynamically. They just exist. 
Now I did just scratch the surface of HTMX because it can do a lot of other things as well, like CSS transitions, web sockets, and server sent events. And HTMX isn't the only tool that lets you work with this pattern. There's also Alpine Ajax for those who are fans of the wonderful Alpine JS library. It's a solid plugin that adds a host of attributes for working with server requests. Unpoly is another contender as well. Like the other two, it uses HTML attributes to update what they call page fragments based on UI elements returned from server-side code. So yeah, next time you're starting to work on a full-stack application, ask yourself, do I need a front-end framework for this? The answer might not always be a resounding yes, and there's a surprising amount that you can accomplish with a server-side framework that returns HTML. Let me know in the comments what you think, and if you've used this pattern in any of your projects, I'd love to hear about it. And as always, thanks for watching.